Hi, I'm Stephen Bruce. I run the Academy of Physical Medicine and here's 45 minutes of free CPD for you. This is just an example of what we do. We run a free session every month along with 70 plus hours of live learning with others CPD every year. If you'd like to see more, click the link in the info section below the video and that'll take you through to our website. Enjoy. Now, when we eventually get today's guest in, I'll be talking to Dr. Robert Schleip, who is, uh, he has a doctorate in human biology. He's also a psychologist. He's a Feldenkrais practitioner, uh, as well as a rolfer, um, but his particular interest is in the science of fascia. And what we're going to be talking about today, I mean, fascia is a very, very popular topic, obviously, in the academy, but we'll be talking about fascia as a sensory organ, uh, fascia, fascia in sport and in movement. Uh, Robert, can you hear me? Yes, I can see you. My adrenaline has been going up and down, so this is very nice. <laughs> Robert, I normally do a sort of 10-second intro for our guests. I've now run... I, I heard you inventing things. <laughs> Robert has been founding, he has been the discovery of fascia and whatever else you are telling them. <laughs> so how is my pronunciation of the Rolle der Fascien in der Arbeit mit Narben, Adhesionen und Kalagenen Versteifungen? Uh, that is the title of a workshop I'm doing. So how, in, in German. So that so did, means, I pr uh, did I pronounce it correctly? Yeah, yeah. So that means uh, working with scar tissues, adhesions, and uh, stiffness changes in fascia. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Good. But your German sounds very good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Look, let's leap straight in, um, Robert. I mean, what, what is it, what is it that's driving your interest in fascia right at this moment? Um. The research by the uh, Stekos is very interesting about the hyaluronan. And uh, that seems to be responsible for some of the short-term changes in manual therapy. Um, so uh, we had all the doubts that with rolfing manipulation, which is my manual therapy background, or with osteopathic or chiropractic manipulation, that you could change the architecture of collagen fibers in a few minutes, because that would be very brutal work that you need to do. But nevertheless, we, uh, we can feel that the tissue is softer after we do a manipulation. So the question is, where, where is the change in stiffness coming? And the hyaluronan seems to be now a uh, very highly likely explanation and uh, that within minutes you can change not only the amount of hyaluronan but also the binding condition whether it's a, a, a slippery hyaluronan yeah. or a glue like uh, very viscous, li like uh, cold honey condition of yeah. hyaluronan. Hyaluronan can be in both conditions and apparently when we apply pressure and shearing motion, we change it from a sticky condition into a slippery condition. So you can hear how, how excited I am about it. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the same stuff, um, the hyaluronic acid, that would be injected yeah. into a joint for arthroscopic um, yeah. procedures and so on. And, and uh, women, at least here in Schwabing in Munich, where I live, uh, if you want to look fancy, you have uh, twice a year hyaluronan injections for lots of money to get the wrinkles uh, straightened in your face. Right. Well, don't say we don't bring new job opportunities to you from the Academy yeah, yeah. of Medicine. <laughs> um, so how are we doing this? What is, what is driving this change in hyaluronan? Apparently, uh, shearing manipulation. That is not proven, but we have a high indication for that. Because the Steckos, Carla Stecco and her team uh, and, and her brother Antonio Stecco at the University of Padua in Italy, they not only found out that uh, hyaluronan is increased if you stimulate the fibroblast with endocannabinoids. <laughs> so they right. didn't say you should smoke marijuana, but uh, if you stimulate the endocannabinoid receptors, which are not there for marijuana smoking, but for other physiological relaxation <laughs> effects. And we know that osteopathic manu manipulation increases endocannabinoids. That has been okay. known. And then people feel more relaxed and peaceful. But that was a surprise, one of the surprises, that uh, when you stimulate the endocannabinoid receptors on the fibroblast, 
that then they produce more hyaluronan. They, they put out vesicles, fluid bags, which are filled with hyaluronan. And, and that would be already one thing to make the tissue, to save the money for the hyaluronan injections in your face. <laughs> okay. uh, and the other thing is they showed that some fascia have a 10 times more hyaluronan density than others. And if you look up what is the difference between those that have lots of hyaluronan and more water binding and who feel more juicy, it is the amount of shearing motion in the immediate vicinity, like the retinaculum or the ankle, that has the nice. highest uh, hyaluronan density, probably because underneath the tendons, every week they make large sliding movements. Right. So if I want to have more hyaluronan on my face, I should do large yawning movements and laughing movements <laughs> in order to get more juicy hyaluronan water binding in my face, but also in my hip joint. Yeah, I don't know about the I don't know about the rest of the audience here, but this is the first I have heard of this. So, uh, how long has this been known? This this phenomenon. Uh, a year, uh, one and a half years. So these are all new things that you don't find in textbooks yet. Yeah. You find them if you love to read small print PDF articles like I love to do to read them before breakfast. And not everybody needs it, uh, uh, well, wants to do that before breakfast, but that is my mental food. And it will also be a couple of years until it gets into the curriculum of different schools because it's hot sure. off uh, research labs. Well, as you probably heard me say, we've had people on the show talking about fascia in the past, and um, almost all of them have said that this notion that we were brought up with as osteopaths, chiropractors, and so on, that we are stretching the fascia somehow when we do our treatments, cannot be physiologically true, because to stretch the fascia would be to cause an immense amount of damage using an immense amount of force. Um, but is making it slipperier sufficient to achieve whatever it was we were trying to achieve by stretching it. Yeah, yeah. There has been a study where I had been one of the supervisors by Annika Griefan, and she uh, measured the shearing motion between the first layer of the lumbar dorsal fascia, which is basically the upper neurosis of the latissimus dorsi and the gluteus maximus, in relationship to the fascia layer underneath, which is kind of the fascial envelope around the erector spinae. And we know from Helen Lajewer's work that they tend to stick together in people who have chronic low back pain. We don't know why, whether that's injury and scarring or whether it's lack of movement or both. But we know this is a very important difference between chronic low back pain patients and normal healthy patients and yeah. probably that is very plausible it's it's influencing the lack of proprioception so if you have a ruffini receptor between the two layers and you go forward to bend your shoes in a normal person you would feel what your lumbar spine is doing and the fascia but if there is no movement happening before, between, between the two layers, the Ruffini receptor between cannot feel anything. So yeah. We, yeah. That we know that the adhesion is contributing to proprioception most likely. And the student uh, that I supervised, she did a ridiculous foam rolling treatment, which is very cheap and you cannot compare it with an osteopath, where people put part of their body weight on a foam roller for six minutes and afterwards, there was more sliding motion between it right. in a very elegant measurement where we, with ultrasound uh, 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 analysis. So we know so there was no movement over the roller. They were just resting on the roller. Yeah, yeah, which is almost uh, a paradox because you're in a roller, you are not doing shearing motion very well. You are gluing, you are compressing yes. the two layers. Yep. And you, you could have expected them being more glued afterwards. What, so what an osteopath is doing is much more skillful than a roller because you're not only pressing down, you're doing a forward trans horizontal sliding movement. Yeah. This is not to say, of course, that the chiropractors aren't doing very sophisticated movements as well. I hate, hate to exclude the chiropractors. <laughs> and, in no, and the Bowman Marco. <laughs> All physiotherapists, of course. Yeah. 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 So, and, the cupping, and the cupping people, actually. Yes. So cupping would be the opposite of foam rolling. 
So you, uh, everybody is doing mechanical stimulation, but are you compressing? Are you tractioning? Are you doing either one with a shearing motion? These are the questions that I love to study. And uh, based on the hyaluronan study I mentioned from the Stecos, I would think the shearing motion is an important component. Right. Well, this isn't the first time on the show that um, it's perhaps been brought to our attention that we may have success with our treatment, but not always for the reasons we thought we were having success. So, you know, that's, it's uh, fantastic to learn this sort of stuff. I suppose the obvious question is, what is the most efficient way of stimulating those receptors, the cannabinoid yeah. receptors? Yeah. Smoking marijuana is not my favorite. It, it used to be my favorite style. But I think mechanical deformations. So here I have my new uh, topic. So you would have one fascia layer on top, the dense fascia, and another layer on, underneath. And in between, you do not have an amorphous fluid. You have another fibrous matrix. So if you slide one layer in relationship to the other, it's not really sliding, it's a shearing motion. Because yeah. in sliding, you assume that there is nothing substantial in between. But if you have a fibrous net in between, and you move one to the right and the other to the left, you are stretching some of their diagonal fibers. And if you can go more to the left than to the right, you can assume that one of the diagonal fiber directions is a little bit more stiff than the other the one from the left to the right or from the right to the left. So I think shearing motion is a key for this lubrication effect. But that's a plausible speculation, and we need to do more research to find that out. Yeah, sure. There's been quite a lot of research. I know this isn't what we're here to talk about. There's been quite a lot of research about the medical use of cannabis, hasn't there? Has anybody looked into it specifically in how it could be used advantageously with um, fascial lubrication, if you like. Uh, I stimulated. Uh, we are right now financing a study with the Stecos uh, based on a very successful online summit that we had. We made a lot of money a year ago mm -hmm. and we were able to donate uh, a five-digit uh, amount to the University of Padua to do a very nice research together. But that is not looking at cannabis, it's looking at the connections with the autonomic nervous system, right. sympathetic and parasympathetic. And, and I'm very keen on that. But as soon as we are finished with that, I already talked with Carla Stecco and with Katharina Fede, uh, that it would be nice to use CBD, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cannabinoidal, so it is one of the potent substances that works without the hallucinogenic effect, where we think it's stimulating the endocannabinoid receptor type 1 and not the 1 type 2. So that would be a very nice study to do, to see if that then leads to the expression of the hyaluronan vesicles, because in the study that Katarina Feder did before, she didn't use cannabis, she used a synthetic uh, analog condition to it. Right. And, okay. uh, but uh, the CBD oil, uh, you, uh, many people take it in order to sleep better. I take it in the, more, uh, in the evening and you put some drops under your tongue. A lot of people are doing that, but the research is not yet completed how potent it is. Yeah, and I guess I'd be interested to know if you take it orally, uh, which receptors does it reach? Yeah. Does it reach all of them? Is there a, is there a case for topical application of um, CBD oil? Ah, uh, I would need to go on the internet to find out, to be honest. No, yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll steer away from cannabis for now. Somebody yeah. has somebody in the audience has asked if you could just run through again. How did they measure the movement of fascia? You mentioned ultrasound, but yeah. So, so ultrasound is something uh, that uh, usually the medical doctors have it in their office. It's it's this huge apparatus, but you wouldn't find it in the manual therapy practitioner's office. Uh, but I predict that in three four years every fourth or fifth uh, manual practitioner will have a sleeky, nice ultrasound. I don't have one here right now, but they are not bigger than an iPhone. And you put them on the lumbar fascia and with a cable or without, they project, project to your smartphone or, or to a tablet. 
And that is something that you can have in, in your office and put it out of the drawer without pretending that you are a high-tech uh, uh, paramedical uh, surgeon. Yep. <laughs> and right. I find these new ultrasound devices highly attractive, but they still have some shortcomings um, because they depend very much on the examiner. So yes. if you want to convince the client that your uh, treatment was very uh, was worth the money, you can abuse the ultrasound very easily and look for a wonderful picture afterwards and look for an ugly picture before that is always easy. And then yes. tell them this was before and now here we have it. Yeah. And and that convinces your client, but you should not be convinced about it. So ultrasound is very much coming. And uh, we are now working together with some companies to make the shear motion into a quantifiable uh, number. But uh, right now, uh, the computer has to work all night to give you a number, uh, whether the shear motion is improved 10% or 30%. Okay, so it begs the question, doesn't it? Um, we, researchers at the moment, clinicians of the future, can show that the fascia is moving better as a result of yeah. compression yeah. or, or yeah. other treatment. How long does that effect last? We don't know yet. The same with foam rolling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all the studies so far uh, uh, are going 10 minutes, uh, but not longer after the treatment. The same with foam rolling. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I guess there's, uh, we should be selling more foam rollers and just saying lie on this for six or seven minutes every few hours. No, we should give the client a treatment uh, with our hands and then... And if they like it, say you can partly do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And I use my elbow to locate places on their back, if they are sitting with their back to me, and ask them to come and meet me. And first they do a clumsy movement, and then I ask them, no, feel where I am, right there, come and meet me. And if they do that, you can see their eyes changing and they're really making contact. And then I give them a foam roller ball usually and ask them to do the same thing, not with the ball and the foam roller on the floor, but towards the wall. Mm -hmm. And then I ask them, come and meet the ball. And you can see whether they do it with an embodied uh, participation and you also can see which ball is correct for them. The osteopaths, but also many other practitioners, used to, to put two tennis balls into a sock yes. and use them on the occiput. And there you can also instruct the client uh, how they allow their eyeballs to relax towards the occiput if they lie on their back. So all these exercises are very nice if you give them to the client at the end of a very impressive relaxation session. Not if the session was not so good, but if they really liked it, then you can say, here, you can do it yourself. And tell me next session how it was. And I may give you a second uh, instrument or a second exercise. And then you give them a, a foam roller or you tell them this one would be the one for you. You can order it here and bring it to me next session and we experiment together. Okay. Um, I've had another question from Karen that's come in, Robert. Um, she says it would be interesting to know, that, to know if there's been any research on the acupuncture meridian system and fascia. Apparently, it's been observed in dissections that there are little holes in the fascia that correspond exactly to acupuncture meridian points that were charted thousands of years ago, she tells me. There is two studies that I'm aware of that found a high degree of congruence between fascial anatomy places that I'm going to describe and the exact location of the TCM, of the traditional Chinese medicine, which is the main system. But you should know that there are minority systems that claim that acupuncture points are elsewhere. But in TCM, they are very exact, and everybody in TCM, traditional Chinese medicine, yeah. agrees on them. The first one was from Professor Hartmut Heine here in Germany. He died a few years ago, and he showed that the majority, over 80%, but not 99%, were identical with perforation uh, points of the fascia profunda, so not the subcutaneous fascia, but the first layer of dense fascia underneath, where uh, uh, trias perforans, 
So three vessels go through it, and there are about 100 places on it. Yeah. And that was already impressive. The second one is methodologically higher from Helen Lager again. And she showed maybe eight years ago that wherever the fascia profunda splits up into a septum that goes deep, for example, in the upper arm, the septum between the flexors and the extensors, between the brachialis and the triceps, there you have more collagen because not only you have the envelope, but from the envelope, you have a vertical septum. Yeah. And that's where you can measure where the meridians are. And she also showed that 87%, if I'm correct, of the TCM places, uh, points are exactly where you have these septi. And of course, the two uh, systems agree to a large extent, not to 100%, uh, uh, 100 because the nerves they prefer to travel along the septi because they are they are more injury protected. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so, there's, a, so there's some logic in that as well as yeah. um, you know, yeah. ancient research. Um, Lawrence has sent in uh, a question. He says, uh, you're attributing the symptomatic changes from shear motions due to increased lubrication. Mm -hmm. How do you know that it's not due to stimulation of the superficial sensory nerves causing a sensory nerve stimulation resulting in reduction of symptoms. Yeah, that would be possible. Uh, but maybe I didn't make it clear. We have not shown that the therapeutic uh, application of shear motion uh, improves hyaluronal. That was my hypothesis, uh, that we, if we do that in the future, we would have it. But we have not shown that in experiments. What was shown in experiment is that those fascia that have a high degree of shear motion, like the retinoculum, that they have up to 10 times more hyaluronan than fascia like the epimuseum around the trapezius or deltoid, which are also proprioceptively very important, but they don't have so much shearing motion because the epimuseum of the muscle if you have a chicken meat, you can see it. You cannot slide it easily in relationship to the tissue, to the muscle underneath. So in the vicinity of the fascial membrane, there is very little sliding, shearing. And therefore, or this goes along with a lack of um, hyaluronan. And on the retinoculum, you have a lot of shearing motion and you have high hyaluronan. And if that is not by accident then it is likely, but not so sure. Yeah, so he's correct. This is not 100% uh, guarantee, but it is quite likely if you improve shearing motion uh, in your hip joint, in your facial uh, fascia, that you would also in increase the shear mo uh, the, the, the hyaluronan density. For me, it makes sense. Uh, hyaluronan yeah. is a lubricant. If you practice shearing motion, the body says I, I, uh, 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 that, that you need more lubrication there. But if you're stagnant there, the, why should you produce lubrication? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know who asked this question, but uh, someone has asked whether it is the lack of hyaluron, hyaluron that makes fuzzy fascia fuzzy. What means fuzzy? I don't ah. know. Ah, okay, maybe. Uh, I, I have, uh, uh, let me see. You said I was sharing slides. Oh, no, I don't have it here. <laughs> no, I was not prepared for this. Uh, but uh, Helen Lajewe, again, one of the my heroes in the fascia field, besides Carla Stecco. And uh, she had shown that the two layers of the lambdorsal fascia are more glued together or more adhered together, less shearing motion in people with chronic low back pain. But in the same uh, analysis, she also showed that the edges of the fascia are more fuzzy or more rugged. So the transition between uh, the second layer of the lumbodorsal fascia and the muscles is a very sharp and clear line yeah. One is uh, and uh, in healthy people and in low back pain people, it's a fuzzy, a less contrast-rich transition. 
And that is an interesting observation. So that would speak more for micro injuries than only for lack of movement. Right. Okay. Uh, Robert, can I take you back to something you said earlier on? Camellia has asked about um, your idea of getting patients to meet you or meet their um, yeah. folk balls. Yeah. Can you yeah. explain exactly what you meant by that? If she says, it, are you talking meet at the point of pain or at the point of a trigger point? It's more proprioception, but it's also, of course, a personal thing. Uh, we know from the two-point discrimination examination, there is a tool, a caliper, where you have two pins. Mm -hmm. And if you have 10 centimeters between them and you touch the client carefully on their back and you ask them, is this one pen or is it two pen? Most of them can feel that it's two pen even if they touch you exactly at the same second, if it's 10 centimeters apart. With three centimeters or with two centimeters, none of the clients can tell that it's two. On your back, on their lips, it would be different. So yeah. two-point discrimination is a very accurate measurement for proprioceptive refinement on different body locations. And we know that myofascial pain, not all kinds, but particularly low back pain and also whiplash, goes along with uh, deterioration or less refined proprioception in that area where they have the pain, not in the rest of the body. And then if I come towards the client and touch them, let's say lateral to uh, L4, and I say, come and meet me there, and they bring L1 and T12, and they bring the whole middle of the back towards me, which is not very refined. <laughs> yeah. And then right. I say, of course, you found the right body part. Yeah, you are very, you're very much at home in your body. <laughs> but can you be more precise? Can you, I'm here, I'm not there, I'm here. See right. if you can feel where I am. And they don't see it. And tell me that you are in contact with me there. And then they do again a big clumsy movement. I say, wonderful, you are in touch with somebody. And the third or fourth time, they can move an area which is like three finger pads, like five, six centimeters large towards you. Right. And, that, and then I'm touched. I feel like they are on the same level of sensitivity as I am. And, and this is a therapeutic value. Isn't yeah, it? So, so that is very much influenced by my Feldenkrais background mm. and Thomas Hanna background, where you're not changing the physical body, but the embodiment from the inside, how much a client is at home and has a sensory refinement inside of their body. And, and I think that is a totally underestimated, no, not totally underestimated, but a richer... Uh, aspect of manual therapy than those people who are not engaging the client and only treating them. Let me free your fascia. You you can daydream as much as you want. Why, so, so why don't you uh, talk with your wife on the phone? I, I can fix your psoas because I'm doing it. So if you engage the client with their mindful attention to be not in daydreaming but right at your fingers, you may be able to differentiate the image they have uh, about their body, where the lower back is not just one wooden board, but it, where, where it has very different areas of expression. Okay. Um, Danielle's asked a question about whether what you've described or how what you've described relates to neuromuscular technique. Uh, and or trigger points, because he says it sounds like it might be an explanation or past explanation for the physiological results in both of those um, uh, concepts. In neuromuscular technique, I'm, I'm using a lot of it, uh, modification of uh, post-isometric relaxation, for example, oh. in order to get the Golgi tendon organs, which are embedded in fascia. They are not only in the tendons, they are all over the epimysium. And they are, of course, very, uh, a very good tool to, to lower the tonus. Uh, yeah. area. So, so that would be already an application that I use a lot. Um, 
And, and, what, and what's good about the neuromuscular technique, post-isometric relaxation, for example, is that the client is not only relaxed all the time, but they resist you a little bit. So, so you ask him to resist, resist, and then to let go, and they feel the difference. So that, for me, is a very good avenue, not so much to reach the spindles or the Ruffinis, but the Golgi receptors. Yeah. And, uh, and the trigger points, um, I'm working a lot together with some, I would have loved to say uh, it is the fascia that is tied in trigger points, but most experts agree, no, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, how do you say, a rigor mortis-like uh, contracture of muscle fibers at, the, mm-hmm. at that point itself, and that you have an oxygen crisis there. But the question is, why does this oxygen crisis uh, start to develop there? And there yeah. you have the so-called taut band, which is yeah. a r- larger area of stiffness increase. And there we are looking most likely at a stiffness increase in the perimuseum, in the intramuscular fascial tissue. But we haven't shown that. We are trying to take some histological sections from horses, because there you can analyze the trigger points and take them out an right. hour later. And we cannot do that with humans. So, <laughs> Right. Well, interestingly, we, we had a session with Dr. Robert Gerwin um, some oh, nice. weeks ago yeah. now. And um, he's done some very, very recent research into the existence and nature of trigger points. Worth looking up on the website if you have time. Um, Robert, Nick has asked whether your technique uh, of asking the client to press back towards you is part of a biofeedback mechanism. That's a very nice way to reflect about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, it's it's not only asking him, do you feel the difference? It's it's a, if you also have to give the client feedback. So it means you have to use your voice and also your touch. So when the client comes towards you more refined than two minutes ago, so you you touch them lateral of L4, and before they came back with the whole lower back, but now they come back with a more refined area. If you then are silent, you miss a point. But if without a second delay, you say, nice, wonderful, or you change, or you whisper, yes, that's very nice. Then they have the feedback. But if you are just using your hand and you're daydreaming at the same time as a therapist, which I sometimes do, but I don't like it, you're missing a point. So your biofeedback means you give them feedback where they didn't have it before. Okay. Um, I'm rushing through this because, of course, we, we are running short of time already. Um, Mike has asked whether what you've described would be applicable to treating people with thickened fascia, and he cites eosinophilic fasciitis. I have never had a case of that. I'm, 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 I'm looking forward. Ulm <laughs> University knows that when they have a patient, they, they, they should be asking me. Yeah, so there are some con- conditions where the fascia is really thick and, and really stiff. Uh, so I know Mike, about Mike. If you have a patient with this condition, call me. Call Ron. Right. Yeah. So then, so then the question is: Can we make the stiff fascia less stiff? Uh, and and I would start with the hyaluronan, but after a few months, usually two to three months is necessary to change the fibrous geometry of collagen fibers. So then I would hope, but hoping means uh, not knowing, (laughs) that you would also be able to change the stiffness, not only of the hyaluronan, but also of the fibrous matrix. Thank you. Uh, Robert, um, uh, we had a a speaker on Tuesday evening, um, Dr. Anne Jensen, who's a chiropractor practicing in um, Australia. And she was talking about emotional components in um, physical pain and dysfunction. Yeah. And she said that there is research or there is a theory that long-term memory might be stored in fascia. Is that something that you're aware of? The question is, what do you mean with memory? The key to memorizing it can definitely be stored, just like a scar tissue. Mm-hmm. And that has been shown. So after you were injured, not only is your architecture changed for years afterwards, and then when you look at the scar and you feel the scar, the memory comes up. 
So the the, tis, the peripheral tissue can be as much a key as if you hear a sound or get a taste again that you smelled right. the last time 20 years again and the memory comes up. But yeah. then the photograph or the taste that you have when you hear the sound of your of the door at your grandmother's house is not the storing of the memory. It's the key to elicit the memory, which is stored in your brain and the central nervous system. Yeah. And that is a much more simple explanation why people, when you work around an injury site, suddenly they remember something where they didn't have access for the last 30 years. But in terms of state-dependent memory, the storage is still in the brain. Right. But the key is hidden in the fascia, and you give them the key to that. Right. Uh, and, and is that perhaps, is that sort of through some nociceptive feedback to the brain, or the, the yeah. stimulating yeah. that memory? Yeah. yeah. Uh, another one is uh, a chemical condition there, uh, NGF neurotrophic growth factor. Uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Menzer, he has injected it into himself. And that is usually, and I would love to do the same thing, <laughs> uh, because that is usually expressed if, if you have an injury, not only if the first time, but a second time. So if you get a drastic injury, uh, then you don't have so much uh, NGF, but within one or two weeks, you, you get a ridiculous re-injury again. And then you have this memory effect because the body then expresses this neurotrophic growth factor, which is very beneficial if you're a child and you want your nerves to grow. But it makes you very much uh, pain sensitive. So if you have NGF in your jaw, even yawning is painful to you. And that stays for weeks within the tissue. So that is definitely a chemical condition that you have if you have a, re a repeated injury condition in the tissue. And then the question is, can we lower the NGF in the tissue? Probably by increasing microcirculation. So with lymph drainage or with going jogging, etc. But, but that is a very good explanation why even weeks later, ridiculous everyday movements are hurting you. Not because you have more mechanical stretch, but the NGF is lowering the threshold, what feels painful and what, uh, and what does not yet feel, feel painful. So that would be a second uh, biochemical threshold that you can lower in the periphery and you don't need the central nervous system in order to make that difference. Robert, uh, we have made a big mistake getting you on our lunchtime show, I'm afraid, because 45 minutes and certainly... 35 minutes isn't enough to discuss fascia with you and I have got so much I have so much feedback from the audience saying how much they would like to hear more from you it's such a delight to talk to somebody who is so enthusiastic and passionate about a topic quite apart from anything else um, but if we if you could spare the time I'd love to get you back in because there are still so many questions coming in here and I know there's so much more you could talk to us about 